Um, let me introduce uh, Tony DeMambro, um, who is a bow maker and restorer. Um, he's been a, a member of the group for a while. Uh, Tony uh, has 15 years experience doing restoration uh, and bow making work. Um, he currently works with uh, Jonathan Price, who I think is also on the meeting. Yes, hi, Jonathan. Um, and um, he's also had training with uh, George Rubino and Rodney Moore, and that's uh, where his background of learning bow restoration and making comes from. So we'd like to turn the meeting over to uh, Tony DeMambro. Right. Welcome. Thanks, Pete. Um, so I was planning to do a more formal presentation, which I, I still will do. Um, I was probably going to hold off for questions until the end. Um, but if there's something pressing, you could probably just text or chat that uh, to Peter. And uh, if he sees an opportune time to interject, um, you know, he'll just unmute himself and, and talk. I know a lot of the terminology I use, I, I use, I just assume everybody knows, but if there's some issue with um, terminology, you can just uh, let me know and, I'll, and I can dive deeper into that. Um, but I try my best in this presentation to discuss all this stuff. Um, I do have some slides um, that I will go through to help show things as well as if I pin myself now you guys can see me full screen. I can't see everybody else in the meeting at this point. I can just really see myself and just a handful of people. Um, so if you have something you know, really important to ask at the bottom of the screen, you can click reactions and click raise hand. Um, so if it's like, you really just gotta ask me, go, go right ahead. Um, or like I said, you can click the chat and uh, type in the chat and, and Peter can interject at any time. So. Um, it is my goal that by the end of this presentation, uh, you guys will be able to identify what a uh, high quality rehair looks like, as well as understand the small details that go into an excellent rehair. Uh, bow makers, we have an enormous number of considerations in mind um, when we are making a bow, and it is the rehair's job to preserve the intentions of the bow maker and to maintain the optimum playing characteristics of that bow. So while there, let me go ahead and share my screen. While there are many aspects that go into a good rehair, there are really only three elements that are evident to a player. So here we go. So, but in addition to these three aspects, um, I will cover the whole rehair process and uh, several additional factors that I consider when executing a rehair. Um, I do understand that there are a number of ways to do a rehair, and I'm not here to advocate for one process over another. Um, the important thing is that a bow is properly maintained and that the end results are of high quality. So before I dive in, here are the three elements. Um, the fit of the head block, the uh, fit of the spread wedge, uh, the hair quantity, quality, and length. Um, I will get into more detail about those, but the fit of the, of the head block, there's a block here uh, underneath the hair that holds the hair in. Um, that part is evident. The, uh, the spread wedge, there is a, there is a piece of wood um, underneath the ferrule, underneath the hair that holds the hair. And then the hair quantity, that is how much hair there is. Um, and by quality, I'm referring to not just the cost or the region that the hair is from, I'm also referring to how the hair is installed in the bow, and then obviously the length of the hair. So keep these three points in mind um, as I move forward and discuss the entire rehair process um, with each succeeding step. Um, sorry, my dog. <laughs> I apologize. With each su succeeding step, um, we'll have a great impact on uh, not only these three aspects, but uh, several others as well. So I'll begin by first listing the sequence I take when executing a rehair, and then I'll dive into each section uh, with more detail. So inspection, uh, this involves checking over the bow for certain signs of wear and, and use. There, these, may be, these are things that I keep in mind when I uh, progress, uh, progress throughout uh, the process. So I'll talk about what I do for inspection. Uh, disassembly, this involves the process of removing the hair the blocks and the spread wedge from the bow. Uh, cleaning and polishing is pretty straightforward. Cutting the blocks, um, here I'm referring to the blocks 
that hold the hair in the head and inside the frog. This is underneath the slide. And I will talk about how I carve them and what they should look like. Um, I'll talk about what choices I make when selecting the quantity and, uh, of hair and as well as uh, judging the length of hair. Um, string is used to tie the hair into a miniature hank. And I'll discuss what those knots look like, tying the knots, um, installing the hair, how the hair is installed in the bow, and the fit of the blocks with the hair all together. So I'll share this process I use when determining the length here as well. Um, fitting the spread wedge, that's the part I talked about that holds uh, this piece, uh, holds the hair the entire uh, width of the ferrule, which is an important element, as well as any kind of adjustment to the screw, uh, really the eyelet. So that's the basic overview of what I'm going to cover today in the rehair process. Um, Prior to doing any work on a bow, as far as inspection goes, I examine it carefully. I also take photos of it. I take four photos of the head and three photos of the frog. I'll show you. So this is the, um, the thumb side or the player side of the head um, from the top, uh, from the audience side, and from the tip plate. I'm looking for any, uh, this tip plate is, is uh, gold, but uh, ivory or uh, mammoth or bone. I'm looking for any chips or uh, uh, hairline fractures. Um, the frog, I take the uh, thumb side, uh, the bottom, uh, I guess the face with the slide, and uh, the uh, finger side, the audience side. And we can see here, there's some things that I'll already, on this bow, I'll have to keep in mind. We can see by the reflection that this uh, ferrule has a bulge in it. It is bulging. Also that the ferrule does not seat fully against um, the ebony of the frog. It's pretty evident too here that it kind of protrudes up a little bit. Um, it's good to know because when I go and, and rehair this bow, uh, that when I fit everything back together, it needs to be like this or better. <laughs> you know, I don't want to think that, oh, I did something wrong. It's not sitting right well. Um, that's actually how the bow was. Um, so I keep these photos on record. Um, they allow me to track the health of a bow over time. Also to cover me if a client ever wants to blame me for something. I have thousands of photos on file, and if they save me just once, it would be worth it. Um, with technology now, it's so easy to take high quality photographs um, with our phones. Um, they're good for reference, kind of like this. They're not good for archival photos for obvious reasons. They, the lenses do distort things um, depending on what you're focusing on. It can make this look greater than a 90 degree. Um, it'll make parts look bigger. Um, if we go back to the head, you can see this photograph, the dis there's a little bit of distortion compared to this photograph in the head just by, um, it just kind of looks a little bulky up on this side here. It's just, but they're good for just protecting yourself and, 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 and having reference. Um, I also like it because I have photographs of, you know, hundreds of bows. And so I can always, oh, what does that bow look like? Or what does that maker look like? I can always go back and just take a quick, uh, you know, visual reference. So I inspect every part of the bow from the head, uh, the stick. I even run my fingers across the stick to see, feel if anything is out of place. Um, the frog and the button for any damage or wear. I'm looking for signs of how the bow has been used um, or abused. Um, things like excessive wear to the handle um, or if hair is missing from one side or another. Um, is the player hitting the stick when they're playing? Um, I do tighten up the stick. I check the camber. I like to see um, how the stick comes up. I also check um, how straight the stick is. Um, though if hair is missing on one side or another, that will affect how straight the stick looks at that time before it's disassembled. Also, once again, I'm checking the tip plate and the head for any signs of damage or wear. Uh, yes. A quick question, a quick question. Um, can you say a little bit what the word camera means for people who aren't bow makers? Uh, just kind of how, what does that term mean? Yeah. Uh, particularly. Yeah, so camber is, is the curve of the bow, um, you know, up and down. And, and it could also mean side to side. I mean, we think of that um, as well, but it's, 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 it's the curve of the bow. 
Um, the curve of bows, um, they may be slightly planed in behind the head, depending on, on what we're uh, trying to achieve, but the curve in, in sticks are, uh, are, are bent into the sticks. We use an uh, alcohol lamp to heat uh, several sections at a time and, and, and bend the stick. Some people do it by hand. Some of us have bending blocks, uh, forms. Um, others use their belly or their leg or the corner of the bench. So uh, I do check that over because not all sticks, um, when, when laid flat on a flat surface, um, the, the belly of the curve may not touch um, the hair. Um, so I keep that in mind in the future when I put new hair in when I'm determining the length. So I keep all these things in mind as I prepare a bow for rehair as they give me an opportunity to make subtle adjustments uh, throughout the process. So after I inspect the bow, I take it completely apart. Um, there are several precautions that I take um, to maintain the integrity of all the parts, uh, like using special jigs and figure fixtures, which I will show. Um, a bow is in its most vulnerable state when it is uh, disassembled. You know, there are many sharp edges exposed. Um, you know, there are like the, I've got other uh, diagrams, but um, the wings of the frog by the liner or the slide rails, I can actually go to slide 36. I'll do that and I'll show you. So this diagram might help a little better to see. So, We've got, uh, when the slide is removed, these rails are exposed. They are, um, they are at an angle. The slide is dovetailed in. So these edges can be, are very delicate. Um, these edges right here of the frog are very delicate. So um, like I said, I use special fixtures to hold these and I'll get to those too in just a second. Um, so I start by removing the button and the frog from the stick so I can access the head block. And so let's see here, it's the next slide. Um, so I've got the, the, a bow. This is, the hair has already been removed. Actually, this is one I think I was making. But um, here you get a clear idea of what the head fixture, um, just it's a little stand looks like. Um, so let me move here. So I remove the head block and hair with a little scribe, a little, um, like engineer scribe, and I take care to not lean on any of these edges of the tip plate. This is one of those places where uh, a technician can easily damage a tip plate, um, especially if the tip plate was made of bone. Those things are super brittle. So um, with the block removed, I'll pull out the hair and I save the previous knot for future reference. Uh, I take mental note of the knot size and quantity of hair currently in the bow. I do this to compare what I think the perfect quantity of hair should be when I put it in the bow and what was in it. I don't like to make too big of a change for players unless I've already discussed this with them in advance. If we take the bow in and it's like, whoa, this bow has way too much hair, we're gonna put in a bit less. Um, but if, if the bow, if they've had no complaints or anything, um, I would still like to compare what I think is the ideal uh, quantity of hair versus what was in the bow. Um, Get a sip of water. I remove the uh, hair from the frog and feral by pulling out just a few hairs at a time until the feral easily slides off. I'm not, uh, I don't use pliers. Do not use pliers. Do not use pliers um, to pull the feral off. If you pull the hair out, um, it will loosen enough um, and the feral should just slide off. Um, using a knife, I will split out the spread wedge, which we'll see in a little bit, um, and I clean off uh, um, any residual wedge wood once I have the frog completely apart. I just need enough room to remove the slide, which does slide out. If the wedge comes out completely intact, I'll save this as well for future reference. So the frog, I'll remount it on the stick because that's kind of the safest place for it. So I'll put it back in without the hair, and then I will use my thumb to slide the slide out. Um, with stubborn slides, I will use a rubber band to aid in grip. 
um, or some powdered rosin on your thumb works well. Um, there are times where solvent or heat may need to be used um, if the slide has been glued in or if rosin, dust, and dirt has worked, worked its way into the joint. Um, occasionally on ex inexpensive mass-produced bows, the slides will be glued. And I don't really think that they've done this intentionally, um, though I, maybe I've seen it once or twice where I think it was, but, uh, um, but as far as these, these bows, I, the, the inexpensive bows are the ones that are mass-produced. I think it happens if like super glue is used in the frog block or in the wedge and the glue seeps up the slide rails. So um, solvents or heat really work to, to break that, um, that joint. Um, you'll notice later that uh, no glue is needed or should be used on the blocks. Um, and then only a weak glue can be used uh, for, the, for the spread wedge. So next slide. So I support the, the frog on a stand to protect the sharp edges of the liner. Uh, and I remove the frog block and the hair with the scribe, uh, taking care again to not leaning on any of the exposed edges. As you can see here, this is a base frog. You can see the edges. Um, these, are, these are just jigs I made to uh, kind of replicate the octagon of a stick and leave room for uh, the eyelet so it can sit on there. Um, with both of the cradles, the head and the frog are, are held by my hand, and it's, uh, the, and it's just the cradles that they help stabilize the head and the frog on the bench. I like the feedback and stability I get by holding these with my hands. Um, I know I've seen cradles, for example, that encapsulate the frog. I'm, I'm not too keen on those because the frog can still rock inside, um, possibly damaging you know, the liner uh, or the wings of the frog. So having a direct feedback with, with the uh, with the bow um, is, is really great. That's why I like these, because they're still held with my hand. Um, I save the knot from the frog as well. Um, if it comes out intact, it may not because I've pulled hairs out, but if it comes out intact, I like to save that as well and take mental note of the knot size there. The frog knot is generally a little larger because we use the thinner end of the hair in the head, uh, which has less room anyways for hair, and then the wider hair comes down at the ferrule where there's more room for the hair. Cleaning and polishing. So with the bow uh, clean, uh, completely disassembled, I proceed uh, to clean the stick with various cleaners depending on what the finish is like on the bow and to what degree rosin and dirt are built up on the stick. Uh, sometimes it's as simple as just wiping it down with a paper towel or on a bow with only light rosin buildup, I find a little violin cleaner polish works well on sticks. Um, occasionally bows require something more involved like alcohol or xylene, but uh, you'll have to be prepared to French polish the stick afterwards. Um, I generally do a light French polish to the stick. I like to do this, especially when the wear to the handle area, uh, or when there's excessive wear to the handle area. I'll show some photos in just a sec. Um, it helps protect the area a little bit from uh, sweat and oils of the hand, I, and I know it's not that much, but I do find it helps uh, offer some protection for a time. Um, if we see here, this, this stick here, we can see, um, I'll point to it here. We can see here like the wood looks washed out and we can start to see some wear along, along the top edge here, right above the center of the frog. So this happens just over, over use, using the bow. Um, if this here, we can see it's even worse. We can see it dip down a tremendous amount. And what we've used here is a piece of leather to protect it, a thin piece of leather to protect the stick from additional um, wear from it uh, going through the stick. But um, with modern bows or bows that have originally had like a high polish, I definitely like to replicate that look. Um, I like to preserve that the intent of the maker. Um, this is a beautiful bow. I just love looking at this bow. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's this was is, is, is was an excellent condition, uh, original condition, and still is. Um, so we try to keep it. You know, I don't want it to glow in the dark, but I, I do want it to be. Um, I'd like to have a nice shine to it. Uh, with with bows of like historically known makers, 
I like to be a little more thoughtful about this process. Uh, generally avoid building up of polish and leaving a more matte look uh, when, it, when, it's, when it's polished. Uh, I am especially cautious of polishing the back of the head, which back here. Um, I generally don't um, or polish the, the, the chamfers, so just, just leave those alone. Um, also very careful on sticks that are octagonal um, or any area that's supposed to have a sharp edge. Uh, one reason an older bow may have softer edges is due to over polishing of the stick over the years. So uh, on, on a bow like this, uh, minimal polishing is, is recommended. So with the stick prepared and cleaned, um, I'll go on and I'll lightly buff the metal parts, such as the ferrule, which is my, my videos in the way. Yeah. The ferrule is, is, is this part right here, um, the button, uh, the heel plate on the frog, that's the metal part here. Um, and this one has a metal tip plate, so I'll even uh, buff the metal tip plate. But I'm using a jeweler's, uh, a jeweler's hand buffer. Um, it's it's uh, very gentle, we'll put, I'm not using a buffer on a wheel with a motor. Um, I'm, I'm buffing these parts by hand. Anything, if, if, if dirt is really built up, I'll use a little bit of very, very fine steel wool um, and alcohol or vice versa, just trying to work the build up off. But um, I will use, I will buff them by hand. Um, it's like a jeweler's buffer is usually lined with, it's a stick lined with felt or suede side of the suede side of leather and I apply a light buffing compound appropriate for the metals being polished whether it's nickel or silver or gold. So I, I do like to buff that, lightly buff them up. They do not need to be mirror finish. Um, when these bows were originally made, um, well this bow was originally made um, or the next bow, they were not you know this high mirror polished we're used to seeing on, on competition bows. Um, you know, they may have been finished with something akin to 400 grit sandpaper. Um, maybe a little bit finer, but uh, that's, that's kind of my take on that. So now that the bow has been cleaned and polished and all the parts are, are kind of prepared, uh, we're ready to move forward with the actual rehair. So the, uh, the hair has knots tied at each end and they're held in place in the bow with a piece of wood um, we call uh, the head or the frog blocks because it goes in the frog as well. And I prefer to use maple for my blocks, but what's really important is the geometry and grain orientation of these blocks. They just need to fit the mortise perfectly without being too tight and hold the hair in place. Let's go on to the next slide. So uh, the head mortise of a bow is, is a trapezoid and a good head block will match this shape exactly. Um, I uh, took this from a photo from, I took a photo of a uh, page from the International Pernambuco Conservation Initiative book. Um, that's the IPCI. They have a wonderful, I think it's a three volume book. Um, I, it's a great resource. I believe we have a copy of this book with our library here with the MVA, and so it's a fantastic resource. Um, it's definitely worth a look, so um, check it out from our library because it, it covers um, the rehair process. I think the rehair process. That's, that's not my dog. That's my dog. Sorry. Let me close the door. We've got all our dogs that want to be a part today. It's I love it. I apologize. Since, since, we're, since we're new to Zoom, sorry to interrupt. Um, and I just learned this myself. If people can mute themselves, especially if there's any possible distractions, but uh, otherwise we'll we'll move on. Thank you. Well, uh, with this, uh, it, it, it does a really good job of illustrating um, the block here has to allow room for the knot and the hair. 
um, we have to have the hair be able to come through here. Whoops, let's go back. Um, so the block can't be too thick, but it also has, to, and it, but it can't be so thin um, that it only sits against the tip plate. This drawing really isn't a proportion, but um, we don't want it just resting on the on the on the tip plate. Or if it's the block was too angled at the back of the head, um, it really should. It's essential that this block sits against the tip plate, the liner, and the pre-buco all even pressure. A block just sitting on the tip plate will likely crack it, and if it is bone, it will crack it. Um, I will also gouge out a small channel on the underside of the block to leave enough room for the knot as well. It kind of helps hold the knot in place to prevent it from twisting or shifting. Um, and this diagram is great because it, it, it shows us the grain orientation. Um, we can see the long grain going this way, and you can see the end grain here. And so. Uh, I think that's really important. I've seen blocks where the end grain is going up and down. Um, makes it really hard to remove the block. Um, there's other issues with that, but this is this is kind of what is accepted and, and what we do in, uh, in the bow world. So, so, um, so I shape my blocks with a knife um, because I'm most comfortable with this tool. I know some people use chisels, which is fine, you know, I like sharp tools because you can shave it, um, make nice clean shavings just like one would fit a sound post. Um, I'm also really accurate with a knife, so I just I just like using that. I will I use a triangular file and, and just do a couple swipes to get this little notch here at the back of the block. This is to um, make it easy for me to pick out the block uh, with my scribe next time the bow comes in for a reason. You can see in here it's gouged out and of sufficient thickness and is tapered on the side as well because the head mortises are are also tapered in. You kind of follow the um, outside of the head. So here you can see how the block fits this shape of the head mortise perfectly. Um, I do allow a small gap for the hair. This gap will get some adjustment once I select the quantity of hair for this bow and I'll open it up just a touch more. But um, this is kind of what I like to see before um, I move on um, to the next step. Now the uh, mortise in the frog is of rectangular shape, and the frog uh, and I carve the block in the same manner with a knife um, to fit this mortise. Due to the um, this mortise being actually a little bit narrower in the frog, and the fact that the hair is generally thicker. At this end, there will be need. There'll, there'll need to be a little bit more room for the hair. So this gap is a little bit larger, and this and this frog is a little bit undercut. Uh, this mortise is a little undercut, so the, the mortise extends past this edge. Let me see on this bow. Um, the bottom of the block is also gouged out, and a nick is added again to ease for uh, easy removal. Um, we can see here. This is taken from the I, IPCI book as well, because the demo the um, diagram. It's uh, really great to see how the long grain is, is this way and the end grain is here. And I do gouge um, a little channel uh, on my frog blocks um, as well. So, uh, once my blocks are prepared, I then select the hair for the bow. Ideally, we want to see a, a thin, um, even band of hair the entire width of the head mortise and the entire width of the ferrule. The width and depth of the mortises are kind of just minor determining factors for the quantity of, of hair because the bow can physically only hold so much hair. Um, but uh, the average amount of hair in a violin or viola bow is about 165 hairs, and a cello is somewhere around 185. So I'm gonna share my personal opinion about these numbers. I don't really think they should be averages, but they should be more like the maximum limit of what we put into bows. Uh, I feel like I see uh, too much hair in bows, and this is my opinion. Um, what I find is too much hair greatly diminishes many of the playing characteristics in a bow, uh, making the bow feel sluggish and less responsive. Um, also, uh, the additional weight can affect the bow's balance and overall feel in the hand. The weight of, of the hair in a violin bow is generally between four and a half to five grams. 
Um, well, one time I saw seven grams of paint. You know? So imagine being a violinist. You know, I'm talking about violin bows. So imagine being a violinist and, and getting your bow back that's now two grams heavy uh, with a modified balance point. It's kind of like, whoa, what's going on here? I mean, that's enough to make it feel like a different bow. Um, but uh, other than, than the space allowed, uh, the strength of the stick should be seriously considered in determining the amount of hair. Um, I'm going to give kind of some guidelines here that I use, and then I'll, I'll talk about how this kind of affects my choices. Um, I'm going to just refer to a violin bow at this moment. So if a violin stick is very strong, um, as far as the deflection goes, it's a very strong stick. This one is not very strong. It's, it's a bit stronger. We can feel how strong the stick is. Um, when, when I'm making a bow, I, I can measure, we measure the deflection, just I'm sure some violin makers didn't measure deflection of tops or things like that, um, where we balance a weight on, on a bow to measure the deflection. I never measure the deflection on a, on a client's bow or a bow that's not mine. I only measure deflection on bows I'm making. I just don't like the idea of hanging a weight on somebody else's bow. But um, over time by... Um, making bows, you get a feel for what is a stiff stick and what's a soft stick, and you kind of develop a, a feel. But um, if a stick is, if a violin stick is like very strong, then we can probably approach that 165 hair limit. Um, if it's quite weak, uh, we may consider up to 10 or 15 hairs less. I know I'm literally splitting hairs here, but um, it does make a difference to an experienced player. I found that it does. Um, so you know, take that for what it, what it is, but I think it does make a, a huge difference. Um, the, like I said earlier, the effect of putting too much hair in a bow will make it uh, feel mushy and have a slower response, and so less hair will generally have a quicker response. On the opposite end of this, a very strong stick with too little hair, um, you, you can't sink into the strings, and it'll want to skate around, and you might lose some, uh, some tone quality. So it won't grab as well either. Um, the way a bow functions, the way the hair functions is a series of slip and stick uh, motions. It's where the, the hair kind of sticks to the string and then excites it in a circular motion and then it'll slip and then it'll stick and, 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 and uh, excite it again. If the hair, uh, if there's not enough hair, there will be a lot of tension um, on, on, on each hair and so it'll want to do more slipping than sticking. And so if a very strong stick, um, the hair, like I said, will skate, will do more slipping than sticking. So you might need to add a little more hair where it will allow the hair to kind of wrap around the string and excite it again in, in that circular torsional wave. And uh, that's where tone comes from because you got most of you guys here are violin make, you know, the violin doesn't work left and right, it works up and down, you know, with the sound post and the bridge as opposed to just side to side. Um, so another thing to consider uh, that I keep in mind is a, a player is prone to losing hairs on the playing side or um, at all, they're hitting a the stick, um, or if the player plays very canted, that is, you know, uh, to a, uh, for a violin bow, uh, kind of twisted away from you on a cello, kind of leaning towards you. Um, so if, if a player breaks hairs a lot, I actually, I find that that happens on bows that actually have too much hair. Um, I actually don't put much more hair into the bow because like I said, I think it exasperates the issue. Um, they want to feel resistance to the hair and so they're not getting it with all this hair. Like they got that mushy feeling. So I feel like less hair actually will give them that feedback. And if anything, when I wedge the bow, I, I, I give them a little bit more hair on the playing side where I may wrap two or three hairs on the playing side of the wedge, just kind of up the side of the ferrule, um, which I find helps. Um, if a player just breaks hairs all the time, there's probably an issue, uh, some concern with, with the strength of the stick for their repertoire or uh, an issue with the camber. If the stick isn't straight and it's kind of coming towards the playing side, they're more likely to hit the stick. Um, so there are some things to consider there, and those are things that you would discuss with the player to fix. 
Um, but if we just, I'm just going to stay on the topic of rehair. So, um, Tony, while we're talking about hair, is a quick question that came up. Is there, um, is there something about the hair itself? Like if someone is breaking a lot of hair, is, could it be the structure of the hair or is that usually not the issue in itself? Um, it, it can be, right? Because, uh, you know, using the, the thinner end of the hair here towards and the coarser hair here, um, the, the strength of, of, of the strand of hair varies from here to here. Uh, occasionally, if the bow is super healthy, and uh, you know the, the deflection, the, the strength feels nice, and the, and, the, and the camber is good, and the stick is straight. Um, I will take half the hank of hair and, and reverse it, um, which is so you've got, and then I kind of mix it up, so you kind of have um, a more consistent strength of the hair across the whole the whole length. Um, I, I like to do that. Sometimes, not all the time. It really depends on the bow and the player. Um, but, uh, it's, a, it's a good uh, trick to kind of help prevent players uh, that break a lot of hair um, for one reason or another. So um, regarding the hair count, it sounds crazy, but I actually do count the hairs. Um, with, with VIPs, I take note of which hair I use from which batch from my supplier and physically count every hair. I do keep record of that. Um, this way I can make adjustments according to the feedback or the demands of upcoming repertoire. Um, I, this way I also have a baseline for these players that are super sensitive. So it allows me to do extremely consistent work for them. Um, I will also count the hairs with the first few re-hairs with a new batch of hair. I do this to account for variance and thicknesses between the batches. Um, and I want to get to know the batch of hair as quickly as I can. Um, so, you know, for VIP, I will use, if I have new hair, I will use the hair that I have left because I know how that hair works and functions. Um, and then I, I you know, like I said, I count the new batch of hair. And then from there, I get a very good idea of what the quantity feels like in my hands. And then I can usually just do it by feel um, from there. Um, there oh, are a question a question came up uh, in terms of how long can hair be stored like is there a, a, a expiration so to speak on hair in terms of having it in your shop once you get it sure um, a lot of it depends on the conditions of the shop you know the humidity or light the hair does not like being in sunlight um, there are some bow makers that store their hair in uh, PVC tubes when not in use um, I go through hair too quickly to uh, be concerned with that. Um, I can't say for a period, I can't say um, for a period of time exact, but I do feel that hair has a shelf life. Um, I have seen and have had hair before that has been old and I do, not, I do find that it is more brittle uh, and uh, inferior to, to, to the fresher hair that I get. So, um, thank you. Yes. Uh, Tony, yeah. what kind of hair do you use, uh, especially for violin rehairs? So I'm using, uh, for all my, all my rehairs, I'm using uh, hair from uh, Mongolia, horses from uh, you know, cold climates. The hair is generally strong. Though um, we can get really nice hair from Canada. Um, and I've, I haven't used it yet, but I've heard of, of good hair coming from Argentina as well. Um, the hair I've been using is the same hair I've been using for about the fif past 15, 20 years. I've been really happy with the quality. I, my supplier, we have a great relationship. If I get a batch, I don't like it, I can send it back and they will give me a new batch. Um, um, I've seen hair from other suppliers from China or from Canada. I just don't like it. And that's just uh, more of a personal taste, a uh, personal opinion. Um, I will all have tried them with some clients. If they don't like it, then, you know, that, that is also a determining factor. Um, what do you uh, specifically look for in hair when you're determining the type that you want? Sure. So um, I will take a strand of hair, I will pull it, and I will see its elasticity, uh, how much it will stretch before it breaks. 
I will also see, I don't like hair that just stretches forever. I like hair that does have a little bit of give and then, and then we'll have a, a clean, a clean break. But if a hair that just kind of keeps stretching is kind of scary <laughs> to me. Um, I like hair that's not too, too thick or too fine, too fine of a hair. I think then you have to add a lot more hair. Um, and I feel that that affects the tension um, of the hair. Is, does that help? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Just have a sip of water. So with the hair selected, um, I tie a knot at the end. I'm using automotive um, upholstery thread. It's pretty durable. It's thin and strong and it hasn't failed me yet. So I, I just, it's kind of what I started using um, when I began rehairing. And if it's not broke, I don't, don't fix it kind of thing. Um, I will add a drop of super glue to the end and it'll kind of wick in to help hold the hair together. I'll also singe the end with a lighter. This is to kind of mushroom that end out um, and to help prevent the hairs from slipping through the knot um, in the future. So uh, a good knot just has to hold the hair together, but there is no law against making your knots look neat and tidy. Um, I try to keep them looking nice so when the next re hair sees my work, they don't complain about me. But uh, it's nice to, to have the knots look nice as well. Um, so I wrap the thread. You can see in the top photo, I'm going to move this, um, several times to make the knot. I make it long enough so that the hair seats nicely in the, into the mortise on its own. Um, so it's just long enough to kind of give it a, a little bit of tension. There's no pressure on it. It's just tension with the natural curve of the hair that it kind of just sits in there. I also don't make it so long where it has to be sideways to get the hair in. Well, I want it long, I don't want it too short either because the uh, length of the knot, um, kind of just the way the block is, is holding the uh, hair in, the knot in, that it just kind of helps prevent it from flopping out. So with the uh, knot in place, I seat the head block into the mortise down here. I never use excessive force uh, to press the block in place. Um, I use a just a, a square tool or a piece of ebony um, and when I'm pushing the block in it's more just to help me than it is to force it in um, and when I push it in I'm usually pushing in and keeping one edge kind of on the tip plate to use it kind of as a stop so I'm not going past the tip plate if you push the block in past the tip plate it's uh, you can create a cheek crack that is a, a crack mm -hmm. on the side of the head and split or split the, the tip plate. The scary thing to see. Um, if when I am fitting the block, if it is too tight, I will still trim it down to avoid damaging the bow. Um, if we see uh, hairline fractures in the wing, this is what I was talking about, they're usually due to a block that was fit too tight. Um, it's, it's rare that a player does something to cause those. Though if it was like inexpensive casing, um, casing does shrink uh, and, and that'll be a place where it breaks or even back here because um, it, it kind of shrinks and it'll just break. Um, and like I, I've, I've talked about bone tip plates, um, they're super brittle, they break and chip super easily. So um, from a bone making standpoint, I, I, I strongly advocate against using bone tip plates I think there was a good while they were just they're super cheap um, and easy to get and there was a good while that people were using bone but uh, I still use mammoth for my tip plates mammoth um, which is you know fossilized ivory um, but there's elfrin there's tip shield uh, tip armor um, did I say elfrin um, there is some high quality casing that works uh, well. So there are uh, lots of alternatives and I like to mix it up. Um, I like to use uh, all sorts of different ones. Tip armor is really nice because it's, it's 
obvious that it's not ivory. So the, the players that travel, um, if, you've, if you're replacing a tip plate or if they're buying a bow or purchasing a bow, it, it's nice that it's obvious that it's not ivory. You have to look at it up close. That's what I mean by obvious, but at arm's length, you know, it looks, it looks really nice. Um, I know like Elfrin, I think under black light, you can tell that it's not, um, but it has some nice grain to it. Um, you know, my concern was sometimes the, like uh, the plastics, um, they can still look like ivory. And the whole point is, is to, um, to make it look like when, when people are traveling to, to, to say, hey, this is not ivory, but still looks nice on the bow. But um, anyways, that was a little side about tip plates. Sorry. One thing if you could mention uh, just real quick, since you're talking about ivory, um, is there, besides traveling outside of the borders of the US, let's say, is there any restrictions on owning a bow that has ivory in it? No, there's actually, well, I mean, I can't be held accountable for this, but I will tell you what my experience is. Sure. Um, there is no, there is not, there's nothing wrong with owning a bow um, in your own personal possession and using it um, personally for, uh, that has ivory. Um, as far as traveling to Canada, which I have an instrument, uh, my, my main instrument is classical guitar. I have ivory parts on that. Um, I have documentation stating that those ivory parts and everything was made before nine, I forget the year, but my guitar was made in 1969, way before this. And I'm allowed to travel internationally to Canada and back to the United States um, um, because I'm using it for personal use. If I were to transport it to sell it, um, that is another story. But I declare it when I'm crossing the border and I declare it that I'm bringing it back. Um, you know, um, in the United States, there are five states where you technically, I can't sell bows that have even mammoth ivory now. Uh, mammoth ivory, I don't know why they, they do this, but I know like California, uh, New York, that's the two I know off the top of my head. There are I, I five maybe six uh, states that you can't even sell uh, mammoth ivory, uh, products that have mammoth ivory, um, which is silly because they're already extinct. Um, but uh, my, uh, my supplier, uh, David Werther, he is an amazing person. He uh, owns uh, Bow Works now and uh, guitar parts and more. And he has wonderful stuff. That's where I, he kind of came up, or he came up with the idea of tip armor and tip shield. Um, so uh, he's a really nice guy, but he's known for um, sh model shipbuilding out of ivory, because he used to be the lar one of the largest um, suppliers of ivory before the ivory ban, and uh, he builds ships and uh, collects ivory and, and uses them. And there's like a whole museum dedicated to his work. It's, it's really amazing. You can check out his website. Um, he's actually um, a stone's throw from Rodney Moore's shop. Um, so he's in Ohio. I don't know what city, but um, it's, it's really cool what he does with ivory. But on his website, anyways, on his website, he does talk about the ivory ban. Um, and he makes really good arguments why like ivory shouldn't be banned um and and just talks about uh, those materials in more detail because he's the one who's shipping this stuff internationally so he's he's a great resource if you guys have questions about ivory or mammoth i would ask him because that's where i got most of my information from does that well i can't hear you pete Oh, Jay just mentioned in the chat that Illinois is also one of the states that has banned all ivory sales. So, yeah. Yeah. So I, I know there's, I, I know there's like five or six, um, but uh, so that's why I like to mix it up um, with, with what I put on my bows just to have different things available. 
Um, if I'm making something on commission, I definitely ask the client what they like and give them the opportunity to choose. Um, my personal opinion is I love the way Mammoth works and how it feels. Um, it feels very similar um, to Ivory. Um, I also believe it does affect the sound. Um, the materials that we use also affects the weight. Um, so a metal tip plate, I think, adds um, maybe a half a gram more than a, uh, a uh, comparable, you know, mammoth tip plate. But, um, you know, kind of quantifying does I, does a, you know, some sort of fossil ivory tip plate sound better? I mean, it's like, does this chin rest sound better on my violin or does, you know, it's, it's kind of like one of those things. Um, can you really quantify it? No, but, uh, do, do we get a sense of it? I, I think I think so. So um, back to the head blocks. Move on to the next. So oh, I got to move the video screen. Okay, so um, what we want to see here is that there is no gap between the tip plate and the hair. Um, we want to see on the next slide. Next slide that the hair is of like just even thickness. Um, this camera's view is kind of angled a little bit, but we want uh, even thickness and the hair comes around the block without the hair or the block bulging, bulging up. Let's go back. Without the hair or the block bulging up. So um, it just, this is this kind of, um, uh, you know, uh, it goes back to the beginning of, of, the, of the presentation where I'm talking about uh, you know, what is evident to a player? And by player, I mean, you know, anybody that's checking over a bow. So, um, you know, we can't see inside the frog what's going on inside the frog. You know, how, the, how does that frog uh, block sit? But we can see what the head block looks like. So, you know, same thing here. There is no gap between the hair and, and, the, and the tip plate. Um, and that the hair is just even thickness and coming across, it breaks breaks nicely across the, uh, the uh, head block. So it kind of helps to see a little bit and the hair is coming off. So. so from there, I then comb the hair back towards the frog until I've worked out any tangled hairs. Um, this is super important when doing a high quality rehair. Um, after a while, you get used to how the comb feels when the hair has been uh, worked nicely, but um, I comb somewhere between 15 to 20 times to work out any hairs that have been crossed. So later on we'll talk about how to check for this, uh, like I said, as it's like a significant factor for de determining the quality of a rehair job. So with the hair installed in, into the head, um, this is the point where I determine the length of the hair. So ideally when the hair um, tension is completely released on a bow, the frog should butt up um, up against the, the, the winding and grip and only taking a few turns um, to bring the bow up to playing tension. So a couple turns, there is enough, uh, enough gap to bring the bow up to playing tension. Um, bows will just about always play their best with the frog as far up as possible. So just a few turns is, is what's ideal. Also hair stretches um, over use and over time, um, especially with the weather. So there are always a few weather and seasonal considerations uh, to be made in conjunction um, with kind of the frog uh, movement. So in Michigan, where we all are, I think, um, the weather changes drastically in such a short period of time. So high quality hair, I also find, tends to be very sensitive to these changes. And so like, so should the person doing the rehair. Um, you know, I have a little hygrometer in the shop. I also keep track of the weather. Um, just. Uh, you know, I, I see what it's going to be like for the next few days, even though that, you know, the forecasts are never a hundred percent accurate, but it does help, um, uh, in making these, uh, the, the following choices. So, um, under humid conditions or right before, you know, the late spring, early summer kind of storm, the hair tends to stretch out considerably. So once again, the strength of the stick is considered here, um, where a strong stick after um, the rehair I complete, after I complete a rehair, um, it'll, be, I'll, it'll be very tight. The hair will be very tight. 
So only requiring, once again, a couple turns, because I know the hair is going to stretch out. Um, this may mean when the bow is completely loosened that the hair does not touch the stick, because I know like literally overnight the hair will stretch out um, just due to the strength of the stick. Um, so I'm not, I'm not too concerned, and usually um, I try to educate the players like they don't need to be concerned at that time of year because the hair is going to stretch out overnight. And if they have any issues, they can always tell me I'll fix it. But um, I like to do strong bows pretty tight in the summer. Um, a weaker stick, on the other hand, I, I tend to be uh, leave the hair a little bit longer. Um, and I'll explain what that might mean. So with some bows, um, another thing to keep in mind, it, it depends on how deep the camber is, you know, how far down this comes. Um, that means when the bow is laid on a flat, flat surface with zero tension, how close is the stick to that flat surface? Um, some people call this the DIB, which is the distance in between. That's the distance in between the stick and the hair at its, at its closest point. So uh, this is why like we inspected the camber ahead of time. Um, it's very common with cello bows, um, as the distance uh, the, between the hair and the stick is approximately three millimeters at its closest point. Violin and viola bows are somewhere between zero and two millimeters. So that's so even when the when there's no tension on the hair, the hair may not touch the stick. Um, and so I know sometimes it scares violin players, but um, I mean as long as there's no tension on the hair and the hair isn't touching the stick, it's 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 okay. And I, I try to communicate that and, and, and convey that um, to, to the player. So, but, on, but on the flip side, with so with colder and drier weather or going into drier climates, I, I tend to rehair a little longer. This is because the hair won't stretch and sometimes could even shrink a little bit. I, it's a, the hair will shrink. Um, so I, you need to leave room for that. Um, I also like to ask musicians. Right now, I don't have to worry about it because of COVID, but um, I ask the musicians if they plan on traveling shortly after the rehair um, so I can compensate uh, accordingly. So if I've got a client that's you know, going to be traveling to France for a, a, a festival, you know, I'd like to know what the weather is like there or, um, or if they're going you know, out west um, you know, to the desert. I want to know uh, what the weather is going to be like there and how long... Is, uh, how shortly after the rehair um, are they going to be traveling. So once I determine what I want the final length to look like, I usually begin the knot. Um, if we go back to, what slide am I on? It's slide 30. I think that's just the next slide. Yes. Um, so uh, earlier we saw kind of where the mortise ended. I begin the knot approximately three millimeters beyond the end of the mortise. We saw kind of where the gap was, but that mortise also went in a little bit further because it was uh, at an angle. So I start my knot approximately three millimeters beyond that. That's kind of my starting point. Um, and then uh, I kind of adjust appropriately. So if it needs to be a little bit shorter, I mean, strong cello bows in the middle of a humid summer, I mean, it's practically like right there at the end of the mortise, where the mortise ends. Um, because I know, once again, I know my hair is going to stretch. Um, some hairs don't stretch as much, but that's why like, I like to get, I like to use the same kind of, uh, uh, the same thing. Um, because I, I, I know it and I know how much it's going to stretch. So with the hair that I do, um, I like to start the three millimeters and then kind of adjust um, appropriately. Um, it's not uncommon for me to um, maybe make it a tight uh, a smidge longer because it's easier to shorten the hair. You can't add length. So I'll, I'll put the, the hair in and block it and put it back on the stick and just kind of see how things are. If I have to shorten it a little bit, um, I'll go back and make adjustments. Um, uh, Tony, uh, so you don't soak the hair first in water? Not at this point. Not at this point. Uh, but I do, I do wet the hair, and, and, and I'll, I'll talk about when I do that. So, um, so I'll tie, I'll tie a, a knot that, that uh, is the length of the mortise, just like the head, and I'll super glue it and singe it with a, with a lighter. Um, just like the, the knot at the head, um, the knot and the hairs slip through the ferrule because the flare of the ferrule has to go on. So I'll, I'll put that through the knot and slide that up. Um, 
and that the ferrule will get secured later with the wedge. It was then secured in the frog with the frog block in the same manner, like I said, as the head. Um, and I, after that, I will do another combing um, to bring any additional crossed hairs in, back into the hair where it will not affect the plants. So after, after that, I lubricated with uh, paraffin, just a little bit of paraffin. So if it was difficult before to remove, it should be a lot easier um, the next time I have to wear it. So uh, with the slide pushed back, the ferrule pushed back into place, um, we can now fit the spread wedge. So for the, for the uh, spread wedge, I prefer to use a softer wood like willow or cedar. Um, I prefer, I use willow. Uh, there are some people that use cedar too, which is great because it smells nice. But once again, what's most important is the uh, fit and the grain orientation, you know, with the long, long grain running this way. Um, the, wedge, the wedge only needs to be deep enough to hold the hair in place at the ferrule. Um, if, they, if it's too deep, you can uh, damage the, uh, the slide rails or the wings that hold the ferrule. Um, also, too tight of a fit can uh, cause the ferrule to bulge or even worse, crack. On extremely delicate ferrules, the socket can, can even be split open. So, um, these are not; these do not need um, super tight. Um, let's see here. So here it is, fit in a small. Uh, I use a small dot of like the Elmer's liquid hide glue um, on the wedge. Um, Germans use white glue. Um, just a dot is enough to kind of help uh, hold that in. Um, and I seat, I seat that. I like to keep this handle on it, so I seat it by hand. Um, so I, I spread the, the hair out with my fingers um, and, and kind of adjust the quantity of hair from side to side to kind of accommodate for the player's playing style. And like I said, I may even wrap, I think this one is hard to see, but I may wrap one or two hairs um, just a little bit on the playing side. Um, so I, I strongly discourage the use of excessive force. Like I've, I think I've seen a video somewhere of somebody using a hammer to seat the wedge. So like my PSA is don't use a hammer to seat your wedges. So um, they don't need to be like, if, they're, if they're, um, if they're that tight, they can really damage the ferrule. Well, uh, the standard thickness, the, the kind of the modern standard thickness for the flat of the ferrule on like violin or cello bows is one millimeter. Um, but you know, on like historical bows, I'll see it even less than 0.8 millimeters. So it can be very flexible, um, even if it's hardened. Um, on bows with a lot of wear, like the round part uh, on this bow here where like the thumb kind of rubs against the ferrule, it can get worn out and get like, razor, razor thin. So um, some care and thoughtfulness goes a long way when fitting a wedge in an older bow. So like uh, on, a, on a modern bow, you know, or something that's like nickel mounted, you can have a slightly tighter fit with a wedge, but on a very thin, thin metal, very delicate ferrule, um, really not too tight. Too tight on the foot. Uh, just enough to hold the hair. So basically, the rehair is complete. With the rehair complete, there are some finishing touches that I, I do. Um, I think it's nice to lubricate the screw and the nipple of the bow. Um, this will extend the life of the screw and the eye eyelet and ensure smooth operation. So taking the screw, I will use. Um, you know, uh, I like to use Rodney Moore's bow lubricant. Um, but a stick of paraffin wiped on the threads works as well. Um, over interrupt for one second. Someone must be unmuted, and there's kind of electronic music that you can hear in the background. So if you could please mute your your microphones. Uh, and then also there's a question from Doug. Um, I'll read it directly. It says technique to tie. Let's see, technique to tie the frog. Keep hairs equal tension after the 180 degree turn? Question mark. Sure. So, so yes. So I do something um, that will compensate for that, and I also do not 
um, some people use a bending stick. So you get a nice um, even tension right across across the width. Well, um, what I find is especially on on like these classic bows that the 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 width they're 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 very narrow. They 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 feel like they want to uh, tip over because they're very tall versus their width compared to a, a more modern school like a Boran. They tend to be wider um, uh, than the, than the classic bows. So. Without why why I don't use a bending stick um, is it creates actually a little more tension on the edges of the hair, and so on a classic bow, it's you're going to get a little bit more resistance on the edge, um, and so that's why um, I don't use a bending stick. Um, so like I usually at, at this point, so I do I do. Um, I, I lubricate the screw because I'll get to about the to the point about wetting the hair in just a sec. I just want to stay on on track. Um, uh, you know, also occasionally or often the uh, the surface between the frog and and the stick gets very dirty, and that can cause some binding of the of of the frog. So I really make sure that that and the underslide, the liner of the frog, are very clean. I clean that every rehair. And then I will also apply a little bit of lubricant here on the bottom facet of the stick because with the hair pulling, that's where the pressure is going to be. Uh, once again, I also lubricate the, the nipple. That's this part of the bow, the little part that's protruding. So now at this point, this is when I, I usually wet the hair. with a, I use a, a paper towel and, and I wet the hair. Um, I tighten the stick just past playing tension. Um, this helps even out the tension across the width. So if it's excessive, you know, it shouldn't really be that excessive. If you use a lot of hair, uh, um, I think, you know, then a bending stick is necessary. With the amount of hair that I usually use, there's no, there's no need for what I like and, and what my clients have been happy with. You know, I think there is room for, for different variations of things. Um, Kind of like cooking, you go to one restaurant for steaks, you know, but you'll go to a different restaurant for tacos. Um, I think the same should be true in, in in our world. You know, maybe you like somebody's bridges, but you like somebody else's sound posts, even though they should probably be done together. That's a poor example. I'm not a violin person. <laughs> but um, so, you know, I think even in the restoration world, you know, um, so, so and so does really great head splines, but somebody else does really great butt grafts. Um, so and so, I like these person's rehairs because of this, or I like that person, this person's rehairs because of that. I think there is room for variation. And I, I, I guess if you were to call it a, a, a style, this is my way of doing a rehair. Um, so I do wet the hair after everything is in place. I find that if you wet the hair, I mean, then you've got to finish the whole the whole job before the hair dries. Everything, then the wedge has to be in, and then there's concern about water getting in to the wedge, you know, because if you wet it too far back, um, and then you got hair all clumped together, uh, I just, I find that if, if the hair is dry, I have more control. Sometimes I won't even wedge a bow until the next day. I will put the hair in the bow and see how the hair stretches naturally overnight, and then wedge the bow the next day. Um, for the client to pick up. Uh, so if I need to make any adjustments there. Um, but um, once the bow is completed, then I will stretch, stretch, wet the hair and, and uh, make adjustments from there. Uh, a bow should always be monitored as the hair dries to make sure that the stick doesn't get too tight. So, um, and lastly, after the hair completely dries, um, if there's any unkempt hairs, I, I use an alcohol lamp. The heat from an alcohol lamp not the flame, but the heat from it um, to kind of bring up any um, loose hairs. And, and, and these last two steps, in my opinion, gives, well, gives my rehairs, you know, just a really nice look and feel. So uh, the rehair is now complete. And I just like to circle back to um, the initial list here so we can talk about um, these things because things that a player is going to be able to identify from getting a bow back um, is 
the once again how the head block is seated you know we want to see a ribbon the entire width of of the head mortise you know um, we don't want the hair clumping together we don't want to see a, a giant gap between uh, the tip plate and where the hair kind of breaks over the block um, uh, in the frog what was visible is the wedge you know this is designed to hold an even ribbon of hair across the entire width of the ferrule. We should make sure that the ri ribbon is nice and flat, um, as in it's not really bulky, there's not a ton of hair, um, and we want it to be the entire width of the ferrule. There should be no gaps on either side. We don't want the hair to clump together. Um, you know, that means the, 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 fer the wedge isn't holding properly. Um, and then the last thing, you know, this, this hair quantity, quality, and length, you can kind of get a, a feel for the quantity, but by quality, once again, I'm talking about crossed hairs. So I want to talk about crossed hairs for just a second. Um, you know, the length, well, back to the length is, you know, what, it, what does the hair look like when the bow is loosened? How many turns does it take to tighten? How far is the frog from the grip? Um, and then the tension, obviously we don't want to see um, when the bow is tightened up to playing tension, we don't want to see any hairs kind of hanging down. We want all the hairs to be uh, pretty uh, under tension. And so checking for crossed hairs, I should have brought home uh, my ruler, but I use just kind of like my six inch um, metal uh, ruler, you know, uh, and I will insert it into the head. Here, I'll show you. Five. Let's go back to 33 here. So here, you can see the ruler, and I start at, I start in the middle um, of the head, you know, I'll start in the middle and I'll slide it down at the head, I'll slide it down to the ferrule, and I'll do it from either side as well. Um, this bow has extremely crossed hairs, it's really evident here, you can see one hair coming this way and some, a couple hairs going this way. Um, why is this important? Uh, crossed hairs uh, greatly affect the tone and the pull of the bow. Um, anytime uh, there's crossed hairs, it's going to give the bow a metallic sound, or the bow doesn't really have a sound, but you know it's going to produce a metallic sound. Anytime the bow draws across a crossed hair, um, it will want to push the hair away from the stick, so there's going to be some sacrifice in tone, um, and also a uh, sacrifice in the pull. It's going to like kind of want to skip, um, so crossed hairs is usually the culprit for that. Um, with bows that require more hair, um, you know, we, we will occasionally see some overlap. So when the hair comes to the ferrule, there might be hair that overlaps a little bit. And overlapping is okay, because you can still only fit so much hair into a certain width. But um, what we don't want are crossed hairs or hairs that are crossed, you know, uh, a few millimeters apart. It, this, this bow was really bad, so I took a photo of it because I thought it was kind of amazing to see. So, um, in summation, I guess, uh, you know, I would call what the perfect rehair reflects the perfect amount of hair um, at the correct length for that particular bow um, with just a nice even tension across the length and width of, of, of the, um, of the uh, ferrule and head. So, that pretty much concludes my presentation on, 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 on rehairs. And I'm sure there's questions. So, let me stop sharing the screen. And I, I do have a question. Um, um, early in the presentation, you talked about pulling individual hairs out to make it easier to remove the ferrule. Yes. I, I've always uh, encountered uh, that the hair will just break at the ferrule if I, if I pull on a particular hair. Mm -hmm. um, well, I'm, I'm, pulling it, I'm pulling it straight out like this. Um, just a couple hairs. Out. Um, if that happens, it, it's probably because they also applied glue on the other side of, of the wedge as well. Uh, I've seen photos of, um, of people using white glue on that side of the wedge, just saturating the wedge with, with glue. If that's a problem, if, the, if, if hairs are breaking and the ferrule is still stuck on, I will try to carefully get my knife in there and kind of uh, I guess, break up the wedge a little bit. Um, and then 
with at least the majority of the hairs kind of removed, I will then use, uh, I will get a, um, one of these um, Jorgens, miniature Jorgensen clamps the, the shaped and, and padded with leather to help kind of hold it. And then I will, I will use a little bit of force at that point, but very, very cautiously and carefully. Okay. Let's see. And then if anybody else, I mean, you're welcome to raise your hand, probably do the reactions because I can't see everybody. If you go to the reactions and, and, and click uh, raise hand, um, if anybody has questions. I'm also open to other questions that aren't rehair related if you have questions about bows. I don't know if no questions is a good thing or a bad thing. Where do you get your willow? Um, my friend, John Price. Um, I think he had uh, a bunch of willow that was just not good enough to use for lining and so on a violin. So um, he gave me like a few chunks. Um, so I, I don't know, it may have been a tree that was like had fallen in, in my friend's yard or something. Um, but it's, it was, uh, I mean, even willow varies. Some willow is kind of mushy and some is a little bit more firm. Um, I, I prefer somewhere kind of in between. I, I like to have the, the spread wedge to have a little bit of give, um, a little bit of softness. That way the hair kind of gets indented when you're fitting it and it does help hold the hair better. Um, also, uh, two things. Uh, first, a comment. Um, willow isn't readily available, I think, in general, but I've gotten a couple of good chunks from the better quality uh, hardwood suppliers, ironically enough. People like Exotic Woods in Burlington, Ontario, or AM in Cambridge, Ontario. Uh, but for Tony, a question. So at the end, you realize you've got crossed hairs. What happens then? Do you start over or do you uh, remove them? So um, with, with my process of, of rehairing, I generally find uh, no crossed hairs because of the excessive amount of time I spend combing. Um, if I do find a crossed hair, if it's less than two or three, um, I will pluck them out. I will pull those out. If it's worse than okay. that, if it's worse than that, that means I, I I screwed up, and I will I will then do a new rehair. That that is just like bad on me. Like I should have done better than that. I didn't comb it enough. I got distracted, or maybe when I wedged it, I wasn't holding it. Uh, I kind of nip, twisted some of the hairs with my hands. Um, I, um, I personally feel I owe my clients better, so I will I will I will redo a rehair if I have to which sucks, <laughs> but it's not so bad because I, I did the blocks, blocks come out easily, you know, uh, every, the boat's still clean, so not as, it's not that bad, but if I have to, I will. I see, Paul, Paul do you have your hand up? Do you have a question? Yeah, um, can, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, okay, uh, so when you're talking about moving hair uh, toward, uh, favoring the player's side, um, is there a point where you can move too much hair where you're in danger of warping the bow when it's at tension? Um, I don't think so. Um, because, like I said, hair stretches out. You know, if a bow is warped, some people comp try to compensate by twisting the knot to, so there's more tension on one side than, than another. Um, but if you wet the hair or you know, the hair gets, as the hair wears out, that, that I find that that does not last. It's a temporary fix for the short term, um, just because the, the hair is going to want to stretch anyways. I think if a bow is, is warped, I think it needs to be straightened out properly. That's my opinion. I, I used, I used to, I used to think it, it helped and I used to do it. I just don't think, I just don't think it does. <laughs> anymore. I really, I, I think my experience says that, it, it, you know, it might work for, for, for a week, but as the hair stretches and it gets used, it's all that is gone. 
Uh, I, I would say it would, it would look really weird if it was like just like very thin and then just very thick. I'm not talking about biasing it that much. I'm talking a very minor, minor bias. Uh, Andrea, on you. Cool, thanks. I was wondering if you have a basic idea how long it takes you on average to rehair a bow. Oh yeah, I, t I take a long time. Um, I take an hour. If a client wants the same day to rehair, I, I budget two hours just in case I have to do it again. Yeah. <laughs> now, Good, thank you. Now, now I've done. I've I've heard of people doing rehairs in twenty minutes. Um, and I, I, I did, I did this one time because I said, I need to see how it's done. I want to see if I can do it. And I had a, I was working for a shop at the time and we had a batch of Brazilian, Brazil, Brazilian wood, uh, Brazil wood, uh, bows. And I had, I had taken upon myself to see how fast can I actually do a rehair? Well, if you don't comb it 20 times and it, as long as the block fits, it doesn't look pretty. And as long as the knot holds, I mean, I've been able to do a rehair in 15 minutes. And it is not the prettiest job, but it's new hair in a bow. And so I can see there is some sacrifice that has to be made. You're not, first of all, you're not inspecting the bow as carefully as you should. Um, I, there's no time to take photos of the bow. Um, you're probably, like I said, not combing it as well. You're, bit, you're probably letting something slide as far as the fit of the blocks. Um, and you're not redoing anything if something isn't right. You're just kind of plowing forward. Um, I think, um, I think, I think an average for for most rehairers is about an hour. I could be wrong, but I think, I think that's a fair amount of time um, to do a high quality bow a good service. I was I was given an estimate of working for a shop that it should take me 20 minutes to half hour bow. I should be able to do two to three an hour, depending on what condition it comes in. And, and I was frustrated that I really couldn't get my quality up to spec that I, that I felt comfortable with at that speed. It took me a good, good hour, sometimes longer when I make a mistake, like you said, double it. <laughs> it's always the mistakes that take the longest. <laughs> Sure, sure. Yeah, you know, when I worked for a shop, yeah, I, I would say I was doing like two an hour, right? That's kind of what they kind of expect you to do. Um, since I work for myself <laughs> now, um, I really take the time because I'm not just rehairing a bow. Um, I think there's there's a lot of people that do a great job of, of rehairs, but what, what I do is I really inspect the health of the bow and I look over the health of the bow. I check things very carefully. I pull out magnifiers, especially if it's a fine bow that's new to me. Like I want just 15 minutes to just look, look this bow over. Um, I like to get to know the bow. Um, um, so if, if it's a new client with like a really high end bow, like I want them to sit there with me while I, I disassemble it, just in case I see something. Um, and it's, I think that that's extremely valuable. So to do a, a really nice service for my clients, and I'm sure what you wanted to do as well, is to really take your time and, and, and see what's going on. Um, but I do know of people and shops that do pump out rehairs every 15, 20, every 20 minutes. And um, I think that kind of is fine if that's what the shop is doing and that's, you know, Different different shops for different people. Different. I think I'm aware. I'm aware of the time, uh, and maybe we have three or four more minutes for questions, and then we'll finish up and take a short break. Uh, but I think Jay had a question as well. Sure. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, you were saying with the stronger stick, you used more or less hair than average. Um, I use probably closer to the average hair, closer to that 165. I use the more. Violin. Yes, I use okay. more because if, if you use too little, the, the hair really won't wrap around the string and, and you won't get a really deep tone, a, a, a tone that, uh, that has depth. Okay, thank you. Uh, I, do, I do also like sharing 
uh, knowledge uh, or experience. Or I also like um, talking with people or discussing things with people. So if anybody ever wants to reach out to me, I, I I'd like to think I'm rather friendly. Um, I, I, I talk with uh, bow makers in France, uh, Canada, um, uh, England, almost on a daily basis on, on like Facebook Messenger. We, we, we talk um, and we, we debate things and converse things. Um, so I, I, I like to have a network of people I like to discuss things with, but um, I'm always willing to grow that network if people have questions or um, just want, want to bounce ideas back and forth or, or study an idea and argue an idea. Um, I like doing that too. I'm also open to learning and growing. I think uh, this is the wonderful thing about this group. Um, with, with many minds together, we can expand uh, way beyond with what one person could do. Um, I, 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 Peter, one of the things I hope to see is more presentations by bow makers. <laughs> Yes, I, 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 I agree. And uh, this is a this is a nice start for the, uh, the in the middle of COVID uh, presentation. So this is a this is a nice start. And I, and I agree and that the presentation was great. I mean, I'm not a bow expert and uh, that's not my area. And it was very informative and and uh, we had some very good questions and, and you covered some really good, good, good points. That's going to be helpful for the, the violin makers as well as the bow people. So Thank you so much for your presentation. It was uh, it was really great. Thank you, Peter. So. I think